Welcome to Your Brand Amplified, the podcast where we interview marketers, publicists, and brands to learn their stories, what makes them tick, and tips and tricks that make a difference. I am about to talk about my favorite topic of all time, marketing with Jeff Brown. Jeff, how are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks. You? I'm doing fantastic. So you are the founder of Box 6 Marketing. Mm -hmm. And I think without aging us too much, you and I have been through a lot of the same thing, seeing the advent of social media, seeing it change from MySpace and then Friendster and then Facebook and then yep. on and on and on. <laughs> yep. I still remember when it came to my university. So oh yeah, my it's, gosh. It's, we're <laughs> Amazing. And so one of the things that you talk about is that you didn't choose marketing, marketing chose you. Yeah. Explain. It was always, always just a part of my DNA. I was a big baseball fan as a kid, but I would find that instead of memorizing stats, I was looking at the Geico banner on the fence and just saying, okay, why do they do this? How much do they spend? And no matter how much I did through graduating college, I actually got a finance degree. So I was in denial for a long time and I would be working in different jobs and would end up doing marketing with you know whoever I was consulting with or trying to sell. And I've actually sold myself out of contracts many times, but I got to help them. And finally just realized this is what I do. This is where I find my joy. This is where I find my happiness and embraced it five years ago and have never regretted that decision. Not once. Amazing. What was the transition like? Um, when you worked in finance, were you working for yourself? Were you working for an agency or a company? And then you made this transition to being your own boss? Yeah, it was different companies bouncing around. And it was just a variety of different odd jobs of getting started on something, either commission-based or salary-based. And the transition was actually quite smooth. At the time, I was doing a little bit of freelance Oh gosh, tech support, email designs. And I was just kind of piddling around with what was right in front of me. And so had a conversation with a mentor and I said, okay, I'm doing this and I'm doing this tomorrow. And so I called up each of my clients and I said, Hey, I'm transitioning. I'm helping with X, Y, and Z. Do you want to do this? And they said, give me the paperwork. And so we came out of the gate on day one with clients and that was pleasant surprise. <laughs> but very, very grateful for it. Yeah, it was great. Wow. So. Marketing, such a big word, so many ways you can go with it. What is your sweet spot? Oh, I think the core of marketing is to be where the attention's at. And so it fluctuates. You know, over time in 2014, I was doing SEO and it's still a very, very valid industry. These days, I am working with email, which when we were in our younger days was supposed to be dead by now, right. <laughs> but it is not a fossil. Uh, it's stronger than ever. We're doing and building websites. And I'd say the majority, the bread and butter is in social media, mm -hmm. hands down, social media, understanding how to leverage it, how to understand algorithms, how to create content that actually attracts visitors doesn't just look pretty. What do you say to somebody who comes to you who doesn't understand? Because one of the things that we see constantly is change, right? Whether it's what social media platform is hot or looking at the privacy laws, looking at how Apple stopped allowing tracking if you didn't want to be tracked. And that's changed the way that people receive their advertising or maybe they're retargeted to by the wrong brands now. Yeah. It's almost worth having a professional just to keep up with the wave. Yeah. You know, right. Like how social media is off. I mean, think about the beginning of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Everybody was on Facebook. Yeah. And now, I mean, the, the running joke is that only your grandparents are on Facebook. And now even TikTok is starting to hit a little bit of that saturation point. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, YouTube has really pushed their front and center on shorts in just the last two months. And so we're actually fighting for market share across different platforms now. And a few years ago, that was never a thing. So it constantly fluctuates. Even right now, there are new developments that are occurring between, gosh, Apple, the litigation suits, uh, Twitter, that whole the Elon's adventure. It's constantly changing. And to have somebody around that can understand and acclimate and just say, hey, look, this new thing dropped today quietly. You can take advantage of it before everybody else finds out about it is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Well, and I've heard, I know Be Real was supposed to be the new hot thing and that's kind of faded. And yeah. then how it's... In Truth Social. Yeah. And Lemon 8, which I've heard is actually owned by TikTok. And it's kind of like in between Pinterest and TikTok. Yeah. You know, this is something that you call the social media vending machine. So how do you navigate this? How do you know, don't press every button, don't buy all the products, like hone in. So when you're starting with a customer, what's one of the first things that you guide them through? 
I think it's to have a true understanding of a couple of things. First off, it's their big why. You know, I want to understand why you do this. You could be a scuba instructor. You could farm butterflies. You could do anything. Why is it that you make hamburgers? I had this conversation with somebody yesterday. I said, you know, you've got four different social media platforms and none of them are astronomically performing. So why are you spreading out your energy that way? And then take a look at the resources that they have because everybody who's in that bootstrapping phase has a thousand things on their list and only enough time to do 10 and everything else just gets bumped. So it's really trying to turn that shotgun approach into a sniper shot and make the most efficient use of their time. So that way they can get the maximum effective production. It might mean looking at one social media platform for a little while and then spilling over into others. I've got another client that I consult with and it's leveraging his existing network. He's got a massive group of followers. So if he just keeps posting, he's growing. I said, okay, well, let's look at some networking now. Because if you can do it, you've got 300K. And if you can do a collaboration with somebody with a million, that's going to be great for you. But I'm not going to tell the person who just started of their Instagram last week to go reach up to multi-million viral influencers. So it's really just figuring out where they are and beginning that custom build strategy for them. And then just go, just do it. Adjust as you go. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you're saying that because that's so much more practical than following some of the big names in social and SEO and digital who are saying, you just have to create that viral moment. Well, those things that are supposed to cause those viral moments, number one, they may not work. You might flood in your face. And the other thing is they may have nothing to do with who you are or how you want to position yourself in the market. Yeah, exactly. And I'm jumping right on you and I'm not even letting you finish oh, your statement. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> they, what we don't see when we see those guys, when we see professionals, whether it's an author or a cook or an influencer or whatever the case might be, you don't get to see the thousands and thousands of hours that they've already put into building this really strong foundation that they can launch up. You know, take somebody like Call Me Chris and she can put out anything. Actually, I saw Billie Eilish just put something out yesterday on her TikTok and she has less than 30 posts. Oh. on her TikTok, but still 38 million followers. Yeah. <laughs> so she can get on there and she'd be like, yeah, I fell down. So I'm doing a plug for Band-Aids. Boom. And then Band-Aid sales are going to increase just because of that. <laughs> so like you're really beginning that foundation level and letting them start trying things. The biggest thing is just to do. Mm -hmm. But copy pasting those formulas is easy, free information that you can get from Google, but it just really may not be practical. And you can spend a lot of time spinning your wheels and accomplishing nothing. And even worse, not understanding why it didn't work. Mm. And you can't make mm. the adjustment to make it work better in the future. Right. Well, do you think that organic is still a valid way to figure out if you're hitting the right target? Because so many things, I mean, I think every time I don't post as much as I want to just because of time. But when I do post, oh, do you want to boost this post? Do you want to boost that post? Do you want to spend some ad dollars? So it's like everything's trying to get you to spend, spend, spend. And when you are working as a small business, you're just starting out or you know, you're two, you're three, but you still need to put your money into other things in your business. How yep. do you know how to navigate that? It's a sliding scale. Advertising or putting money behind energy and organically doing energy is a sliding scale. And it really depends on where you are. I've got one client and this guy, I love him dearly. He's always bouncing around and he'll do that five bucks a day for two weeks on this post. And then he gets another one that he likes. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do five bucks a day on that one. And he called me recently. He's like, man, I've got a video that's doing 30,000 plays and he's got like 400 in his following. I was like, well, that's great. Do you know how it worked? He's like, yeah, I don't know. And we're talking about all the organic side. And then he goes, yeah, I didn't even really put any more money into this. And I was like, wait, 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 you're buying the... Well, that's why it's going viral, man. Like, So it's really going back to that understanding where your resources are. If you're bootstrapping and you have absolutely zero dollars, then you're going to have to put in the energy organically. But if you've got some actual money, you've got a full-time job, and this is a legitimate side hustle that you're trying to build as a backup plan, then you can build yourself an ad strategy and try to get better KPIs for paying for it. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to pay for it, then you put in that same amount of energy. It's really just money just provides the shortcut. This is assuming that you're spending it right, of course. I love that you just said that because I feel like, yeah, you're going to getting more eyeballs, but are they the right eyeballs? Are those people then converting? I have a funny story about the end of the year. People were circulating one of those little crossword things. The first three words that you see are your mantra for 2023, right? Yeah. And I know we're getting towards the latter end of 2023 now. But as I said, oh, that's cute. So I posted it. And then I went back and looked. I'm like, wait, what is going on here? I had hundreds of thousands of comments. People were sharing it all over the place. I have no idea how because they were not my target audience. They weren't going to convert to people who are going to actually start following me. They just were going to that one post. And then I started getting... And I still get DMs that say, get started. I'm like, I didn't do a campaign. I didn't run any ad dollars on something that said, hey, you want to blah, blah, blah? 
Yep. You know, DM me, get started. So I'm like, did somebody else accidentally spend money on this? And then it went to me. It's funny because even though I'm in marketing and I do teach digital marketing <laughs> at university, I still don't have the answers to this question. And I'm like, oh, I had a great viral moment. It got millions of views, but I have no idea why. I didn't put any money or time or effort. I just thought it was a cute little thing and I put it up there. And it's not converting people to actually become followers or users of anything that I'm selling. Yeah, which makes it an empty KPI. Like yeah, it's exciting, right. but it, exactly. the secret of the algorithm is just as valid as the secret of Coke. <laughs> Nobody has a true understanding of what it is. And the real reason for that is we are constantly at a battle of integrity between the algorithm and the content creators. The mm -hmm. content creators want to manipulate the algorithm and the social media platform wants to utilize the algorithm to create content that is curated to the individual. It's part of how TikTok took off so much is because they had the greatest curation model of anybody out there. And Google has had the same struggle for a long time. I remember around 2008, 2009, they started depreciating backlinks because people were just manipulating. They were yeah. creating pages that had thousands and thousands of backlinks. And Google said, okay, we don't want people manipulating this. We want to offer value, right. not a tool that can be manipulated. So yeah, it's the algorithm is always a bit of a mystery and we're doing educated guessing. That's a huge part of marketing is educated guessing. Yeah, definitely. And to the point of tools always changing, you talked about email lists. I mean, that's something that we own, right? Or that a business yep. owns. And that's one of the only things that you own, your website, your email list. We don't yeah. own the content we put on social media. Those channels could go away tomorrow. And if you don't have those posts saved somewhere, you're losing all of that beautiful content that was created for you. Yeah. And all of those fans and all those followers and all those email, especially with a lot of it, you were talking about it earlier, the new litigation, the new privacy, all that stuff that came down. You know, emails acquired through first party data. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, they're invaluable. You can take them and transfer them over to anything. You can use them to plug and say, hey, this short term platform is a thing that we're going to use. We may lose it, but we want you to sign up for this. What are you going to do with your Facebook page that has 120,000 followers on it right now? You're not making great use of that. And the same thing is going to be true for TikTok in a couple of years, possibly Instagram. They've held on really well, but having access to a first party resource like that, where you don't have a third party in the middle that could take that out mm -hmm. is incredibly invaluable. That's why we've kept it. And not to mention the conversion option of just how quickly and effectively you can convert somebody into a paying customer, into a repeat paying customer through email. But yeah, they're in your club at that point. They're not in the clubhouse that somebody <laughs> else has provided. You own the land. Yeah. Well, and for those who are listening who might not know first party, third party. Good point. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I think most people who listen are pretty sophisticated, but there are people who are newer entrepreneurs. So first party cookies is somebody is a customer. Somebody has interacted with you. They're in your database. So then it's much easier to track them when they leave a breadcrumb going from your site to other places and do advertising campaigns that bring them back to your website. Third party is they might have found you somewhere, an ad, a post, you're on a podcast, whatever. They're not in your customer database yet. But that's what a lot of people use right now for marketing, for targeting people. But third party cookies are going away. Google has delayed it. But by next year, they will not be a thing anymore. They will not be a tool in our toolbox as marketers. Yep. And Apple openly declared war on it a few years ago. Yeah. Which is why I've told people over and over, you need to do some kind of capture on your own thing. Don't just assume that you're always going to have access to Facebook's customer base, which is really what you're doing with third-party data. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to reach people that live in this area. And Facebook says, okay, we'll provide that information for you. Mm -hmm. If you have it on your own, it cannot be taken away. And seeing the tides that both Google and Apple are both saying, hey, your privacy should be preserved and somebody should only have access to you if you grant that specific permission for them mm -hmm. means that third party field in the next five years, we're not going to recognize it. It may be completely null and void in a few years. This is long term projection to start gathering first party for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So email list, email list, email list. Get those Absolutely. people, get their information captured so that you have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the trends that you see coming out in the next six months? I mean, we haven't even touched on AI, which we know it's been around for a long time, but people really just started recognizing it in the last six months. 
Yeah. Well, it's not even AI. That's the fun part. I remember, again, showing age, but I feel safe doing that here. So let's get... <laughs> I remember when cloud computing first came out, you know, cloud storage, and it wasn't original. That was not new technology. It had been around for years. You know, the old F drive for those of us that are old enough to know what that is. But the thing is, it was just commercialized. What we're looking at here is machine learning. And machine learning has been around for a long time. Video games that would match you with other competitors that were equal skill. It's the exact same process. But AI, I think, has just recently in 2023 passed the point of convertibility to be usable by everybody. It's not just a cool toy where you can go tell ChatGPT, you know, show me this or give me a great recipe. It's actually become practical. And even in the last few weeks, everybody releasing an AI tool that is specifically relevant to their product. Jasper, ClickUp, Google has recently launched theirs, Microsoft, and they're releasing it that is very applicable and enhances the ability of you to do whatever it is that you're there paying a subscription to do. I think that is the roots that it needed to put. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to replace the industry. We went through this exact same conversation over and over and over. And even before the internet, it's not going to replace the internet. It's not going to take over the internet, but it is going to become a necessary tool that people need to understand how to operate. What something you said is pretty interesting. You said, you know, you can go into like ChatGPT and you can ask it to spit out a recipe. I've heard of a lot of people using it to put in their LinkedIn profiles. Okay, make my LinkedIn profile look better or write this cover letter for me or this social media prompt or I'm traveling XYZ. So do you think that AI is going to eventually replace the word Google? Like, you know, let me ChatGPT that instead of let me Google that. Mm hmm. I tend to be a little more skeptical on technologies because it's so easy to get caught up in the trend of it. Yeah. And then not remember that a couple months later it disappears. See, for example, Harambe. Like, when was the last time anybody talked about it? I think it's going to become a necessary tool. It is not going to replace anything. Photoshop did not replace graphic designers, the right. microwave did not replace home chefs. Yeah. It's going to become an extremely valuable tool that people use. And I do believe that professionals are going to be specialists in utilizing AI and professionals are going to use AI as a supplement to their profession. And mm -hmm. I think you're also going to see people who negatively manipulate that system. Some people try to create entire blogs that were designed entirely from AI, and you're going to be able to see the lack of quality. That human touch is still going to remain relevant because at the end of the day, it's not actually artificial intelligence. That yeah. human touch is the only thing that can still create that connection where a brand can connect to an individual. Yeah. That cannot be programmed, at least not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully never, because I don't want us to be out of jobs too. Yeah, I like my job. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go sabotage it, make sure it, it doesn't become too bad. <laughs> so yeah, in this day and age, it's funny because I almost feel like social media, digital is so important, but we drive our car down the street, we see billboards, we listen to the radio, we hear commercials. Now there's a movement towards CTV. So putting commercials on the, all the streaming platforms that are not actually commercials in the show, but just show up, whether you're looking at a streaming platform on your phone versus your smart TV or whatever. Yeah. And I also kind of appreciate it when I get something in the mail now, because that's so underutilized. When I remember like... Like in the year 2000, and I was launching a music magazine and then launching the official Xbox magazine. And we did so much direct mail to, I mean, primarily to advertisers, right? To get them to advertise in the magazine, in the actual print publication. It wasn't online then. But do you think some of those other tactics are also going to become more important as differentiators in the marketing ecosystem? Ooh, that's a fun one to do a brainstorming session mm -hmm. on. I kind of want an individual case study because that's the really fun part. I think as long as we receive mail, there's going to be an interest in direct mail. Now, how valuable is it? How expensive is it? How practical is it? I think that's going to bend and flex the same way that it is right now. You used to be able to go buy, like, I want 10,000 mailing addresses inside this zip code, and you can then go buy a direct mailer and attach it to those addresses. It used to be a bit more expensive just because the demand was higher and they could just simply charge more. But now it's dirt cheap. Hmm. It is ridiculously cheap because these agencies that still have this information just don't have as many customers. Wow. And so they're willing to let go of it easier to make a sale. So I can see the constant adaptability in things like placement, product placement, or direct in-your-face commercials. It's going to continue to adapt. And we haven't even touched on Web3 and what that possibly is going to do. You know, you can sell the skins. And if you wear a skin that has our brand on it, then we'll actually pay you for it on your avatar inside this world. It's going to continue to adapt. I think we're going to look back at this in 10 years and be like, remember when we used to do social media with everything? <laughs> right. It's wild, but it's true. Yeah. I think I recently read an article about how on Amazon TV shows, right? They have that product placement now where you're going to be able to, I don't know if it's available everywhere, but 
if it's not, it will soon where you, you'll see products in the background and you can just click on that product and then have it be put in your shopping cart. Of course. That didn't surprise me in the slightest bit. No. The House app has done that for a while. If you're staging photos and you're looking at this kind of design thing, you can just uh-huh. click on it and there's the thing. I've, I have seen Amazon doing that a little bit more and it ties in really, really well with product placement. I mean, goodness, for anybody who's watching Ted Lasso, it's weird that everybody in England has an Apple product, which is right? <laughs> does not track at all. But you know, everybody has an iPhone. Nobody has a case on it. The uh, Doritos it was the episode where they were all playing for their national teams and Doritos was very prominent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is constantly adapting, which is why when I do get clients sometimes that say, you know, we did this thing, we were doing Google paid ads and they were dirt cheap and we were getting leads constantly. I was like, this sounds amazing, but it sounds like a while ago. So when was this? And he goes, oh yeah, it was 2009. I was like, bro, okay. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> the industry's changed, my friend. You'll still get the leads, but it's just going to cost you 10 times more than it used to. Wow. And it's going to constantly adapt like that. Yeah. So do you work with any specific verticals or do you work with kind of everybody and anybody? Like what's your sweet spot? In general, I tend to prefer working with smaller to medium sized businesses. So usually past a certain revenue point, less than 100 employees, because I like to work directly with the visionary. And that usually means working directly with the owner. Mm-hmm. You know, if I could work directly with Branson on Virgin Galactic, then that oh, would be yeah. amazing. But I'm <laughs> going to end up working with somebody in the marketing department. Yeah. Because you can really capture a lot of their passion and their why, which is such an important part of that branding message. And one of the things that I and the team that works with me, really incredible creative production team. We love establishing those things from scratch. You know, I have one guy that I said, you know, hey, we're getting started here. I need your logo package. And he's like, what's a logo package? It's your logo and the variants. He goes, oh, well, there it is. And he pointed at the embroidery on his shirt. Oh, no. I was like, is that it? He goes, yeah, that's it. So helping these moments and getting him a logo package that he's actually currently using to wrap a semi now, which is awesome. So awesome. (laughs) Helping them establish those things from scratch and pushing new ideas that they perhaps have never thought of before, not continuing a vision that was created by a department somewhere. It's great that people do that. It's just not our particular passion. So typically small to medium business owners, a lot of the same marketing principles apply to somebody who's never been doing them before. So we can apply a lot of those things. I work with bars, with music venues, with disaster restoration companies, influencers. A lot of those same principles apply to each. And that's just just simply where we get to have the love. Because when you get to celebrate a massive success with an owner, they are getting excited because their kid's going to go to school now. Like It's such a different factor of what that outsource or what that success point means for them. Right. So it hits a huge passion point for us. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I also like to work with smaller entrepreneurs, startups, people who are... They're a special breed of crazy, aren't they? (laughs) They really are. They And we must be as well to work with them. (laughs) Oh, definitely. Admittedly. (laughs) So you mentioned one thing, which was the logo. And I also find that sometimes I'll get clients who say, are coming to me for PR. And I'm like, wait, you are not ready for PR. You don't even have your brand identity. A logo does not make your brand. So we have to take them back to the basics. What are some of the other pain points and things that you see when people come to you and say, Hey, Jeff, we really want to work with you. Do you have a whole process you walk them through to make sure that they're the right fit for you and that you're the right fit for them? I do. It's actually a much simpler process than it may seem. I asked them one question. It kind of feels like Walking Dead. How many walkers have you killed and how many people have you killed? It is, who are you trying to reach? Like, who is your perfect customer? And if they answer everybody, we're usually wrapping up the conversation pretty quick because they don't even have an openness to be able to niche down. And I've learned from experience, we're going to be fighting with them the whole time, trying to drag them through this thing that they really need to do, as opposed to somebody else who answers that question with, you know, I don't exactly know. Sometimes they'll start describing themselves because entrepreneurs' initial brand is their identity. It's at least how they see themselves in the mirror. And if they're open to the fact that they know that they need to qualify this stuff, they would create their own brand identity if they only knew how to do it. Yeah. And they're open to having somebody hold their hand and walk them through this process because they know it's going to be good for them. They know they're going to be hearing things that they never thought about. They know they're going to be hearing things that maybe sound scary, but they're willing to do it because they know that it's necessary in order to take that next big leap. Yeah. Those are the people that we'll work with. And usually the conversation is just boiling down to, will they be flexible? Hmm. Do you have any client stories that you can share with us? But how it worked or about how it didn't? Either way, whatever you want to share. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> 
Not so I'll start with the bad one and then I'll go for the good one. So mm. let's end on an up note. I had one that was absolutely delightful person, just real go-getter type of personality, entrepreneurial spirit would just say, okay, let's go do this thing. Think of an idea and a couple of weeks later, it's reality, which is amazing. But every single conversation we had, and this was a time when I really kind of needed the money. And we talked about it and she said, yeah, well, I want to do this and this and this and this. And I said, well, I want to help you accomplish that. But the process that you're talking about getting there is, I don't think it's going to work. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, I-, I want you to try it. So maybe do a little bit of your way and then do a little bit of my way. And so I was like, okay, well, again, needed the money. I says, okay, we'll do 50-50, but I'm going to show you the successes on both ends. And we worked together for about six months. And then she said, hey, I'm going to bring in some part-time people. I'm wondering in our last month, would you just teach them how to do everything that you're doing? No, I'm not going to do that. But I want to show you here are the things. And so I did actually meet with them and sort of give a on the way out the door. You're like, hey, no matter what happens, I still care about this brand. I still want to see it be successful. And so you know, do these things. Make sure you're posting something every day. Keep talking to the community. If somebody comments on a post, say something back. You know, these things that were not part of the original strategy because the client was just thinking, sell something, sell something. She treated her customers like vending machines. Ooh. And it created a very, very superficial relationship. And I was trying to strengthen and was able to do some of that. Unfortunately, it's died off at this point, as opposed to somebody who was actually in a very similar industry. And we would sit down and talk. And I said, you know, what about doing this? You know, you sell tickets for events, but what about when you sell out? And it's like, well, we just have to turn everybody away. It's like, okay, well, let's brainstorm. Let's think of some new ideas. Ideas. And this was a music venue. And what we ended up doing was created one of the first permanent streaming products Ooh. for a small business, which was 11 months old at the beginning of the pandemic. And so we ended up having the ability to put out live music in a desert of content. I'm talking a small place with 140 seats. Oh we were gosh. creating content for Jimmy Kimmel for Fallon, for Colbert, for the Grammys. I did research. I tried to find somebody else who could do it that wasn't just pointing their phone and recording. Mm -hmm. We were pretty much the only people that could have a celebrity come out, play on stage, have a recording to them that day that had a decent enough quality. And it really kept the business alive because the business at the beginning of the pandemic had enough money for about six weeks. And we went through months of lockdown before we were able to reopen. And the notoriety that it created on the international platform for this really small place was truly remarkable. But if that conversation had begun with, yeah, we sell seats for tickets, that's it. No, I don't want to deal with cameras. That's too complicated. I don't want to mess with it. It was that open-mindedness that created a multi-six-figure revenue generator for this client and kept them through possibly one of the hardest business challenges that our generation is going to face. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it's something they can still use to keep monetizing. Oh, absolutely. Not to mention because music is a special niche. I mean, it is a special place in the heart. And to be able to get a recording of that show from six years Mm -hmm. ago that just really hit different, you've got that forever, is very heartfelt. Not to mention profitable, but still incredibly important to what that is supposed to be at its very core. Yeah. And in this visual age, that's like having the mixtape, you know, getting the CD of your favorite Grateful Dead or jam band performance yeah. forever or whatever that, you know. Not to mention from a content creation standpoint, you know, Bill Gates, I think it was 1983, content is king. Those three yeah. words, if somebody took that one principle and put it into their social media channels, they're going to be huge. It's just simply how it works. And to be able to have daily 90 minute recordings of music in order to convert into content for a music venue, you have more than you can do. You have more supply than you can possibly output. And that's the perfect formula for anybody. It doesn't matter if you're doing financial services or making pizza. You find those methods that creates more content and it becomes invaluable what you can do with it. Well, let's talk about that. Video is so important now. You talked about YouTube shorts. I've even seen like, you know, YouTube podcasts now. Spotify, you can upload video podcasts. All these platforms are quickly moving. I did an interview with somebody who does SEO and has completely moved to doing video SEO. Yeah. So what do you think is a good mix? Because obviously, it's not easy for somebody, especially when they're starting out. Maybe they don't have the budget to hire somebody to do videos for them. So how can they incorporate video into their strategy when they're starting out? We're looking at a very unique age right now. We're looking at an age where we have some of the biggest companies on the planet are offering you and they're telling you, we want to bring you customers. Right. And we want to bring you customers for free. <laughs> but you think about the business algorithm approach yeah. to what Instagram is. They say, we want followers that are looking at our app for a long time. So they see ads. 
by the way, we're not content creators. So we're going to reach out to anybody who wants to create content and create an environment where people sit on our platform longer <laughs> looking at your content. We're going to deliver you millions of customers and we're not going to ask for a penny for it. Yeah. It's insane. And wow. additionally, in the last two years, we have moved into a really icing on the cake variety where you can take any medium and still generate something from it. If you've got text, if you've got transcriptions of an audio into text, you've got audio alone, you've got video, you can really, speaking more specifically to the small business owners, to the entrepreneurs, you can really do whatever feels comfortable. If you don't like being on camera, you can still create videos. It's incredible. I've done tests where I just set up the phone on a stack of books because I try to go as cheap as possible, stack of books, piece of paper, and just hit record and write the message that I'm too scared to get on a microphone and say. And it just makes this cool piece of content where you're watching it unroll on that piece of paper. Ooh. Yeah. Or if somebody like doesn't that. know what to say, yeah. say dude, just get on it and just talk for five minutes. Just talk about anything for five minutes. Just start talking about your work and you will find a 30 second segment inside that five minutes that you didn't realize was good because you weren't programming it. It was coming from here first. Mm -hmm. So there is a practically unlimited number of ways that you can create content that somebody's going to enjoy consuming. Mm -hmm. And then you attract customers that way. Everybody can do it. Most of the time, they just don't know how. Yeah. Well, speaking to that, one of the things that you said to me in the pitch when we were talking about you coming on the show was that a 45-minute podcast should create at least 100 posts before it's tucked into storage. Most definitely. I'm not disagreeing with you, but I know I don't have the time. I'm not going to pay a team necessarily to make 100 pieces of content, especially if they're US-based because it can get expensive, expensive, right? Yeah. So what are some of the ways that somebody can do that? I mean, sign me up. I would love to create more content. I have some good scheduling tools, but yeah, walk us through that. What does that look like? And I've heard other people say, when you have a podcast, you create this much stuff, make it last six months and you post this and then you go back and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So yeah. Can you distill this for us? Most definitely. And I want to just like show appreciation for the moment that I saw cartoon question marks popping up over your head. So that's, that's wonderful. The thing, in it, and I put out content like this constantly because I'm always trying to think of these little things that if you just unlock that little door, it's going to open up a huge room. You just never thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. And what most people do when they sit down to create content is they think about what kind of post am I going to create? And they're thinking about it from that one time single use piece of paper where you write it up, you have your one post, and then you crumple up the paper and throw it away. But if you start thinking more about ideation, you know, try to think of the idea and not necessarily the post because one idea by itself can stretch into a video. It can stretch into you on camera talking about it. It can stretch into somebody else asking you about it as a customer to the professional. It can be an audio only where you're just running B-roll stock media over it. It can become a subject or even a single paragraph inside of an article that you're writing about. It can become the entire subject for a podcast or even just a little snippet, a rapid fire versus a dissection. Because even if you nutshell something or you write down the three steps to make that idea plausible, you have two different pieces of content. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I give people that unlocks a lot of reusability, you know, think about how much juice can you squeeze out of that lemon is thinking about something that, that could be evergreen content. And evergreen is just what we've started calling it because of how valuable it is on the recycling side. So like we're talking about this now and we can be talking about it in February or November or June, and it's still valuable. So you can take that piece of content, put out one bit, take this one minute segment of what we're talking about and talk about what evergreen means. And then talk about how to do it. And then talking about using it, putting it on the shelf for a couple months, pulling it back out, re-editing, tweaking it just a little bit, and then putting it out again. And there's your three. And if you have three different platforms, there's nine nice. where you can pull the audio and put different video over it. And now you're at 18. So it's that duplicitous element of taking an idea and figuring out how many times can you utilize this with different approaches, different platforms, different channels, different interviewing methods, or whatever the case might be. And it becomes practically unlimited. Then you're thinking more about ideas, which we're much more inclined to do as people. Yeah. I like that reframe. So don't it think changes about the post. Yeah. Think about the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I'll typically start with that. Just my last little bit, because there's there's hours of conversation about <laughs> this method, is that I usually tell people, just get a list. If you are a digital person, you want to put it in a note on your phone. If you are a pad of paper person or even little post-its, 
and just start thinking of ideas. Like this would be something cool to do. This is something that I would enjoy consuming. This would be something I'd have a lot of fun creating. Just something about my business or customer testimonials or how to make the best pizza or here's when I'm working in the office. Here's how I make a good snack and all those things. And then whenever you sit down to actually create content, you go through that list and you say, okay, this does not sound fun today. This sounds more complicated. This sounds goofy and I'm in a goofy mood. So I'm going to jot that. And this is your ever running brainstorming list because then you get to be a producer instead of trying to switch hats between brainstorming, creative, production, especially like introverts. Now I have to go talk to people and I'm just not in the (laughs) mood for it. It is really that changing that approach on how you produce that'll make the biggest difference on your ability to get to what I call the absolute bare minimum, one post per day per platform, period. And if you can't do it, don't commit to it. Okay. I'm not calling you out. Yeah. <laughs> I promise. I, I definitely feel, yeah. <laughs> so, Jeff, with your company, Box Six Marketing, you have a very robust Instagram. You share a lot of great tips. I was looking at it earlier today. Good. But you also, right before we started, right before I pressed record, you were saying that you have some new things that you're coming out with. So, can you share those? Are they available now? How do people yeah. access them? Yeah, they're available now. Our mission is to really make marketing accessible to everybody on the planet, anybody who wants to do it. So we're not creating a bunch of high level, top tier. Now, for some, we do, but our brainstorming, you know, what else can we create? What else can we offer? If somebody comes and says, Hey, I've only got $5 because of either the country that they live in and it's harder to get US dollars, you know, whatever the case might be. And they might just not have the budget. And I want to always be able to say, Okay, well, we've got something for you. You know, somebody goes to a car dealership and they say, You know, I've only got this much money and they kick them out because they can't afford a Mercedes. No, if you've got to walk out with a motorized scooter, you just need transportation. So it's a similar effect. So one thing that we just recently launched, and I'm actually incredibly incredibly proud of it. It's called Post Builder uh, and it's from postbuilder.co. And what this is, is a flat rate. So unlimited access to basically a marketing company's output. So we create captions, we create visuals, we create reels, carousels, graphics, and it's just this database and you get to scroll through everything. And you say, okay, I like this. This looks pretty good. You click it and download it. The idea is to take absolutely everything that was on that page, captions, graphics, whatever, and be able to convert it and post in less than a minute absolutely everything to be able to post in less than a minute. So we've built a customized tool for all of those visuals. So if you look at this video and you're like, okay, this is really good, but I'd love to put a picture of my jewelry into Mm -hmm. it. You can just click customize. It'll open the template in Canva, click and drag the photo of your purse, export, and you're done. And it's flat rate. We've got it priced about as good as we possibly can. And people can actually use code free month when they're signing up to get their first month for free. I really want this to be easy for everybody to say, yes, I want to do this. If you own the business, If you are an influencer, if you're a service provider, if you're an actual product provider, or even if you're a social media marketer working with multiple clients, it is idea prompts, it is captions, it is graphics, it's reels. It's basically an entire content plan. Not to mention, we've also got uh, stock video and stock media through Pexels also plugged into it. So it is a single resource that that is anybody's first stop. Fantastic. Posting every single day. Yeah. Nice. Okay. We're definitely going to have to check that out. Is there anything that we didn't cover today that you would love to tell the audience about? Oh, man. (laughs) I had this conversation last week. It's starting to sprout little saplings. Okay. And it was really talking with somebody that I know and trust in working in the financial industry. He's an advisor. He's a great, great speaker. And so he said, you know, I, keep, I know I need to keep doing social media. It's a conversation I've heard a thousand times. I know I need to do it. I know I need to do it. I was like, well, why don't you? He said, honestly, I'm, I'm a still- marketer and I'm like saying that. Yes, I still do the same I, I thing. Time, yeah. <laughs> and so I said, well, why don't you do it? He said, well, I'm scared. I was like, what are you scared of? He's like, I'm scared I'm going to get on camera and everybody's going to think I'm stupid. It's going to make me look unprofessional. Hmm. It's like, man, were you scared the first time you drove? He was like, oh, yeah, dude, I was terrified. And I still remember mine too. Like, we drove around the neighborhood once and then mom was like, let's go to Walmart. I was like, you mean in public? Like, no, I was terrified. <laughs> but I don't get the same fear anymore because I've driven thousands of times. I said, man, the thing is, you just need to look at this little dot right here and just get used to looking at it. Just get in front of it and talk for 20 minutes. Just do it scared. And the fear will subside. You'll get used to that. And the great thing about social media is that the algorithm exists to find your quality. Mm. So it's like sediment and water. If you put out absolute garbage... The sediment's just going to sink to the bottom. The algorithm is not going to show that content to that many people. And when you do something that's good, even by accident, the algorithm's going to push that up. It's going to sort it out for you. So if you're still planning, you're scared, you're not sure what to do, how to do it the right way, 
is just go. Yeah. In the last thing that I gave him, I said, think about any influencer that you follow on the regular and tell me one thing that was covered in their first hundred videos. I don't. I once went back. Gary Vaynerchuk is a guy that I follow a lot. And it took me 47 minutes to scroll his Instagram to get back to his first posts. Oh my gosh. It was so long and they were crap. I mean, honestly, and I love yeah. him. They were just so bad, but it was just figuring out that style, figuring out the platform, figuring out the audience. So get the bad stuff out of the way. You know, you're know, you scared nobody's going to pay attention to it. You know nobody's going to pay attention to it. So just do your rough drafts, put them out there. But if you're not posting constantly, then you can't know this type of content works. My audience responds to this kind of stuff. I'm going to A-B test and I'm going to try this with more emojis. Do I need to do subtitles? Do I need to have my mug on? Right. But if you're not posting regularly, if you don't go out of the gate, you're never going to get there. You're going to end up being exactly where everybody else is. So that's the one thing any entrepreneur that I've talked to, I want to make sure they get that message mm -hmm. is just go. You're going to get bruised. You're going to get scraped. You're going to go through this entire turmoil of chaos in your head of anxiety. Everybody else does it. It's the people who push through it that end up making something incredible. It's how you end up having 40 or 100 or 300,000 followers that you can actually convert. Yeah, I love that. Makes me reflect on when I started this podcast. <laughs> I was really like, I'm only going to interview PR people and I'm going to ask them five questions. And it was a little awkward. I'd had a radio show before that. I'd had a Facebook show before that. I'd hosted two other people's podcasts, but every single one is a little different, right? Yeah. But I had to fine tune that over time. And I don't even want to go back and listen to those first few episodes <laughs> but for that exact reason. I'm like, oh yeah, they're garbage. Like they're just, they're not good. Um, and you fine tune the process and you realize, well, wait, I actually do so much more than just PR. So I want to talk to other people or I'm also a small business owner. So I want to bring those people on or I'm interested in how to feng shui my office. So, you know, somebody to come on and talk about that and like how having a more organized space is going to make me more productive. I love what you just said. I'm really taking it to heart. And I think everybody who's listening should as well. So Jeff, thank you so much. And yeah, of course, we'll put your resources to the show notes, box six marketing and. Postbuilder.co. Postbuilder.co. Last question. Do you have a mantra, verse, quote, family motto, words of wisdom that you live by? This is the first one that came to my head. <laughs> I would not have answered this on the survey. Okay. My grandfather, I looked up to him incredibly, still one of the most honorable, integral men I've ever known in my life and lost him almost 20 years ago. But I still hear his voice when I'm just processing things that are just really, really hard. And I'm a chronic overthinker, constantly overprocessing. So I'm the one who holds back. If, like, if I just do 16 more hours of planning, then this will be perfect. I'm that type <laughs> oh of gosh. guy. And I hear his voice. He talks about the KISS method, but some you know, baby boomer grows up, their, their anagram is a little bit different. It's keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of look at it you're like, okay, okay. And when I'm just feeling overwhelmed, like I just have to stand up and move because I'm just so overwhelmed in this moment, mm -hmm. I hear his voice. That's all you have to do is keep it simple, stupid. And you just laugh at yourself because of what you're doing. You refresh and then you, you yeah. just go. Most people don't care about you as much as you are scared that they are. Exactly. exactly. And so just do it. Something to grab a hold of. They want you to provide value. So they're going to be looking for the value. If you sit in a comedian show, you want to laugh. It's yeah. the same concept. So just go. Awesome. This was such a fun conversation. I know that I could geek out with you for hours. Like I have all these other questions. So we'll have to get back on another time. Have you back on, talk about the next iteration of postbuilder.co, talk about what else is going on in the next six months of, in the world of social media and owned media and all the different things. So Jeff, thank you again for being here. And to our audience, thank you for listening. Make sure to leave a rating and review if you haven't. Let us know how you like these episodes. Check out everything that Jeff is putting out there in the world. I know it's going to make all of our lives a lot simpler and more streamlined as you're trying to navigate this crazy world we call marketing. And with that, I'll be back again in another few days with another amazing expert. Want more? Check out amplifywithannika.com or follow me on socials at amplifywithannika.com.